Now this point type that you see right here, this determines how we're going to store the values on disk. So as you can see, we have a variety. The default is float32. That's a single precision reel. That's the, typically what you're going to be storing, a single precision reel. We do have double precisions that are float64s. And I'll talk about this float16 in a bit. But generally, that's what you're going to be using. So we'll talk about that first. Uh, in addition to that, float32, or float32, we also have an int32. It's an integer type, and of course, this maps back to uh, correctly back to these tags as we saw them. This is the float32 here. This is the int32, and then we had this third one here that didn't take numbers. It just showed us these values. That's actually a digital point type. Now, the digital point type works like this: with when you create a tag that's a digital you would specify what its digital set is. And what we're doing is we're going to map all its incoming values to some predefined and, and finite number of character strings that you define in this digital set. So the big finish to this would be let's go out and let's look at this digital set called modes. Let's see what's in there. OK, I just switched over to the digital state table. And here's that digital set called modes. As you can see, it takes these values. And these are simply strings that are mapped to whatever input we're getting from the uh, data source. So we're actually going to be storing these as integers, but we map them to these strings here. It's a more compact storage, ends up faster for speed of retrieval. Anyway, it's just in general a good way to store this information. If we take a look back at our point builder, here's my digital tag. And if I look at its current value, its current value is cascade. And cascade was one of those digital states that you see right here. Now you'll see digital states later on, sometimes when you're looking at our message log. Uh, sometimes regular Pi tags are going to take a digital state that's part of our system digital state table. Now this is a locked up table. This has a variety of different system digital states that we use, you know, just to indicate when there's things that have generally have gone wrong. So for example, you'll see a digital state called bad data in the system digital state set. Anyway, that's a minor point, though. Any Pi tag can take any of these digital take, uh, states. Now, here's uh, this one digital state set called modes. is just one of many digital state sets you can create. They're, these are user generated. So here's one called phases, where somebody decided to list a series of eight phases. Uh, presumably, he's going to be assigning a digital tag, one of those phases, so that you can track uh, you know, pr production of a batch, or for example. Uh, here are. Here's something called interface status. It's indicating whether we're receiving or not in receiving data for an interface. So this is the type of thing that we store in a digital Pi tag. So those are the three big. We, we just looked at the float, the integer, and the digital. And the rest are, are, I wouldn't say of lesser importance, they're just less frequently used. So let's take a look at those less frequently used. Uh, now I, I mentioned an int32. We also support a 16-bit integer. I don't, I don't think you're going to find anybody who really is going to go for that 16-bit integer, you know, in the interest of, of having a smaller footprint in terms of archive usage or maybe faster speed of retrieval. That's not the primary reason why we support in 16s The primary reason is to support compatibility with earlier versions of the Pi system. See, we've got some people who've got Pi, Pi system data. It goes back to the early 80s. And it, of course, in some cases, their data has been stored as this older type, this int16. Uh, for quite a while, that was the, uh, the default integer type. So anyway, that's the primary reason you see that. I would probably not recommend that for anybody uh, who's configuring a modern system. Uh, same goes for uh, what we call a float16. Now, the float32 and the float64 are pretty straightforward to understand. Float32 is a single precision reel. Float64 is a double precision reel. You know, this ends up taking four bytes uh, for storage. This ends up taking eight bytes. Now, what about this Float16? Uh, the Float16 is actually a storage that, again, goes back to an earlier version of Pi. And we primarily maintain this, again, for those users who, st who still have Float16 data. Now, I could tell you much, much more about the Float16, and I will, but I'll wait to the end of the video. So you can skip that if you don't plan to ever use these or don't have any existing Float16s. So the rest of these point types, a string, string is simply a character string. 
uh, we can store up to 976 bytes. That could be useful for doing, say, things like operator comments. You know, just about everybody in production's got some kind of a uh, oh, some kind of a notepad that uh, they use by operations to mark down things like, you know, Fred dropped his hat in the slurry. We've gotten high impurities, things like that. That's the kind of stuff that you would stick into a string. And by sticking it into Pi, of course, it becomes part of the long-term history of the the operation. So it's a it's a nice little feature for storing operator comments and things like that. We also have something called blobs. Blob stands for a binary large object, although to be honest, they're not that large. Uh, 976 bytes could basically be anything that you'd like to put into that as a binary object. And then finally, we have a point type called timestamp. Uh, this would be a pi tag whose, well, it's got two values here. Uh, just like uh, we were looking at before with our, let's take a look at Excel here. And pi values, or all pi values have a timestamp and a value. Well, what would it be like if the second part of this, the value, were also a timestamp? So it would look like this, timestamp and then another timestamp. We've actually had requests for this over the years. So for example, if an operator enters a 12 o'clock reading at 12.15, what you can do is you can say, okay, here's the timestamp at 12.15. He entered this value that was going with the 12 o'clock reading. So the timestamp is actually something that's going to be stored as the in the value slot. So that is supported, and that's something we've had customer interest in, so we've supported that. Okay, now for those of you who actually do have float 16s, let me go into this into some more detail. What it was is it was a, a very clever way of kind of storing values that were float values, but storing them as integers to make them more compact. And let me just bring you this up this old illustration here. Uh, what we did with a float 16 is we would take a value that came in from the data source, like this value right here, 250.9. And we would figure out what percent of the overall range that was from 0 to the top of the range. So it's going to depend on what the tag is. But anyway, let's say we, we get, in this example, 250.9 on a tag whose range is 0 to 500. We figure out what percentage that is. And then we take that percentage, 50.18, and we figure out what falls along the range of 0 to 32767. That's 2 to the 15th, by the way. Uh, what we can store in a uh, in a 16-bit float 16. Anyway, we figure out where that 50.18% fits along this scale. And as you can see, they're just they're corresponding here. So on that scale, we come up with 16442. But we don't store it as 16442.4806. We only store it as an integer, 16442, which in fact ends up introducing a bit of error. As you can see, we're no longer uh, 50.18, now we're 50.17853. Now, when the user goes back to look at this later on, we pull it off the archive, and this 50.17853% is applied to this scale, and it comes back as 250.89270. So what started as 250.9 ends up coming back as something very close to 250.9. Now this introduces error, and of course the question is, why would you ever do this? Well, primarily for the compactness of the storage and the speed of retrieval. This is a wonderful mechanism for storing a tremendous amount of information in a very small space. And for years and years, uh, this was the de facto standard way of implementing Pi tags. So it was a very robust standard. The only people it would affect to any extent at all would be those folks like this down here. Somebody that's got a very large zero to span, zero to 20 million, for example. See, if, I, if I'm trying to map that to just a range of 0 to 32767 here, basically trying to measure this 20 million units with a ruler that's only got 32767 tick marks, well, that would be a problem. So, um, so but those were the only people that it affected. I mean, for, for the vast majority of users, uh, you know, the, all they had was spans like this, 0 to 500, typical production ranges. And for those fee people, this was an excellent trade-off of speed and compactness of storage. Now, the modern Pi system doesn't really rely on float 16s. But there's no reason it couldn't, if, as long as you understand what the restrictions are. I would stay away from them. They're typically not what we would use. And again, I'm sorry to spend so much time on something that's such a peripheral topic. But you know, this is, uh, this is why you find these float 16s out there. If you have float 16s in your system, you this may help to explain 
why sometimes it looks like the data has changed from what you saw when that data was first uh, grabbed by the Pi system.